good morning myself dr anita jabbar uh, we will be having a comprehensive approach and practice pearls of the dry eye in the coming 55 minutes so let us settle and then we will start the panelist please accompany me dr anil dr madhu and dr arjun retina people please clear <laughs> so before we start let us give you let me give you an overview about what we are going to uh, present before you the uh, topics are very few Didact didactic lectures are uh, only three in number the topics are hand picked and uh, if time permits permits we will have a panel discussion about your common doubts regarding dry eye uh, about the what is the what are the uh, armamentarium you have in the management of dry eye you know lubricants may not be the only thing so you can select from a lot of other things like sometimes you have to give anti inflammatory agents so the common doubts will be when to give when to give tacrolimus or when to give cyclosporin when to give secretogogues and also other modalities of treatment like punctal occlusion and all so uh, i am sure many of the points will be covered by the speakers and if at all there are any doubts you can stand up and answer uh, ask the questions there is mics provided or uh, you can write it a piece of paper and pass it to me we can we shall try to include that in the panel discussion so we have two didactic lectures osmo protection and dry eye and mgd why i have included these two tops, topics are the dry eye is not the same for the etiop the etiopathogenesis will be different like osmolarity hyperosmolarity will be there in some eyes sometimes there will be meibomian gland diseases so if you treat everything with the same lubricant how will your patient benefit so we have to have an idea what is happening in the dry eye and address to that etiology or pathogenesis Osmo protection and dry eye will be covered by Dr. Anil Radha Krishnan. Anil requires no uh, introduction. He is a good friend of mine, and he is from Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences. Uh, Anita, the time limit is seven minutes. Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. Thank you, Anita, for the opportunity. Uh, when we think of this structure, cornea, the beautiful structure that you see every day, it it retains a lot of moisture on the surface and its regularity is very vital for its functioning. One for the transparency, second for the feel of it. You know. So cornea, as you know, has the highest nerve density. I think uh, the number of nociceptors per square millimeter, if you take, it's about uh, 7,000 nociceptors per square millimeter. It's easily 300 times that of skin. No wonder why we, when we get a small uh, foreign body in the eye, you are so much irritated. So that is, uh, there is something called a lacrimal function unit. I don't have the time to go into that. Basically, it, it has a, there is a good efferent and efferent system with which uh, uh, God or whoever has designed it has made it possible for it to function optimally. So the TFLM consists of a multiple constituents. I think now it, now everyone knows that it's a bilayered uh, film that you have. Uh, the lipid layer which prevents evaporation and then the big aqueous layer which is containing both aqueous component as well as uh, mucins. 
there are mucins right within, within the aqueous layer as well. And as you see in the top picture, you see a lot of lactoferrin, a lot of immunoglobulins, electrolytes, a lot of stuff which no artificial tears can substitute. So when you get a disruption in any or uh, one of the components, quite often there is a problem. So dry eye is a, a multifactorial disease in which the homeostasis is lost and in which uh, there is, and in the new definition they have included the neurosensory abnormalities as well. So we should also realize that when the cells are, uh, in between the cells there is something called the intercellular cement for which hyaluronic acid is very, very important. So when the cells are, uh, when the cement, the layer comes down, actually the sensation that comes out of the surface would be much more. So the epithelial thickness also, as you know, quite often reduces in dry eye. And when it is hydrated properly, uh, the sensations that come from the surface are much, much less. So the ideal, ideal artificial tear should be able to restore the ocular surface and to bring about the normal hemostatic state, which nobody can, no, no uh, product can. So tear substitutes in general, it reduces the friction during the blinking. And if you look at the viscosity of it, it's normal tears is about 9 millipoise and tear substitutes are anywhere between 10 to 44, which tells you that it makes it slightly viscous and uh, there is some amount of blurring, which is quite usually transient. Uh, there are different categories. Again, time doesn't permit me to go into all the details, but I think it's very, 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 very difficult to get any proper literature on this because there are multiple studies. Most of it is are funded studies. So uh, to uh, come across a non-funded study, which is very difficult, I think I was lucky to see the study and have uh, put some uh, data out of it. So what we use commonly are uh, semi-synthetic cellulose derivatives, methyl cellulose and uh, carboxymethyl cellulose. So these are demulcents. They are slightly makes the, the, the tear film more viscous. It retains the tear film for a long period of time and there is less friction on the surface. Host of products are available and uh, among between HPMC and CMC, CMC is a better mucoid adhesive. But in general, both are almost similar. And among the uh, synthetic polyvinyl polymers, uh, these are slightly different mechanism of action. It works like mucin. It attaches to the epithelium and uh, basically makes the surface more smooth. That is the polyvinyl alcohol, povidone and uh, polyethylene glycols and all that. So it lowers the surface tension and that's how it stabilizes the tear film. So uh, certain products like uh, Sustain, I don't have any commercial interest, but I just want you to know that, that these bind to uh, this HP GOR is there, which binds to hydrophobic sites. And uh, there are active demulcents which are there in the surface. HP GOR keeps all together and it provides a extended protection. So there are, among, even among the so-called system, there are multiple things that is available, so, so, so much more confusing. And uh, in, in uh, sustained balance, you have, along with that, lipids are also present. In sustained complete, you have electrolytes also. So in osmo protection, what you mean is there are uh, small hydrophilic osmotically active substances that modify the cellular water intake. It, it basically prevents against hyperosmolarity or hyperosmolality induced hatred. So there is... As osmoprotectins goes into the cell, it is the increased duration of action of the dimers can, can be expected. So there are different type of osmoprotectin uh, protectins. I think a few are available in the market. Uh, erythritol, uh, glycerol are well-known things. Trehalose is there. Sorbitol is there. L-carnitine uh, is there. So when you have a normal cell and when it is exposed to hyperosmolar environment, it gets dehydrated. In the initial period, it is reversible. So if you have, uh, if you are using osmoprotection, it's more likely to come back to normalcy uh, than uh, if it goes to a permanent state of damage. If it goes beyond a certain stage, there will be apoptosis and cell damage, which is irreversible. So there are, uh, the, the, these solutes, what we say, these are having multiple uh, ways of entry into the eye, into the cell. So glycerol has a passive diffusion, while erythritol also has a passive diffusion. L-carnitine has uh, basically, it uh, through amino acid uh, transport mechanism, it goes inside the cell, and that is an active transport mechanism. 
So these are uh, two slides comparing the action of MMP that is a, a collagenase that is an inflammatory marker on the present on the cell at different osmolar concentrations. At 312, which is near to normalcy, it is not there. But if you go to 450 milliosmolar, the amount of inflammatory markers go up. But if you pre-treat the patient with L-carnitine and erythritol, the inflammatory markers are slightly less. Uh, so there is another compound, trehalose, which is again useful. It is a disaccharide protective. It also forms a gel around the cell organelles and it is supposed to stimulate autophagy and uh, that's how it protects. So there is a good paper, randomized controlled trial. I'll take one more minute uh, from our uh, All India Institute in Jodhpur in which they have done a reasonably good uh, study and they have found that uh, trehalose along with uh, sodium halterinate is uh, quite useful. So, but we have to understand that there are a lot of ion channels in the dry air which we have not really come across. This is one of the uh, recent papers which came from Narad Netralia. They found that a lot of channels are there. The red ones are action which causes dry air features. The blue ones in action resolves the dry air features. So, a lot of channels are there. If you just see uh, the action of few channels and few molecules get into that, that doesn't work that way. So, it's a much more complex mechanism. We have just made uh, baby footsteps there. Uh, the other important category is the humectants, which in which hyaluronic acid, it has got a good mucoadhesive action, it has got a reparative process also, it attaches to CD44 cells and uh, it has uh, known to cause uh, uh, healing process of the epithelium. And uh, hyaluronic acid CMC combination is a good uh, one and uh, there is a meta-analysis which tells that it, the combination is really useful. I think a lot of options are there nowadays. I think one of the things which are not available in our market is one is decofasol and rebamipide. I think uh, these two drugs are very effective actually it is there in the Japanese and Korean market and uh, it is doing very well. So in the interest, interest of time, I'll just say that it is uh, it increases the tear leopard thickness and increases the objective and uh, subjective scores. And if you combine decofasol with uh, sodium hyaluronate, we know that uh, it is much better than using sodium hyaluronate in any other agent. So I think uh, now, I think uh, the, if you compare with uh, the data which is coming from the West and if you look at the data which is coming from the East, the Japanese data appear more appealing to me in that there is a target for uh, tear film oriented therapy in which there is a significant type of short breakup time dry eye which is very commonly seen in our context and uh, in such people dequifosol and rabipamide are very good agents. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anil. That was a very informative talk and uh, he had summarized everything and last few slides were particularly very important. He had summarized uh, what is happening when there is hyperosmolarity and uh, when will you choose an osmoprotectant dry eye and dry, uh, lubricant and we will be uh, dealing with more in the panel discussion. So we have uh, one more uh, young speaker. Uh, he will talk about the latest management of MGD, mebomen gland disease. He is uh, other than, none other than Dr. Madhu Udraju from WISAC. And uh, I welcome you, Dr. Madhu, for this session. Thank you, ma'am, for making me part of this session. And thanks, Rini, sir, for inviting me to this Golden Jubilee celebration of KSOS. So I have no financial disclosures. So the scope of this talk would be under the following headings. So if you see mebomian gland dysfunction is a chronic and diffuse abnormality of the mebomian gland and uh, it's commonly characterized by a terminal obstruction with the change in quality and quantity of the glandular secretion. If you see this is how the mebomian glands look normally, that's the upper lid and lower lid. In upper lid you have 25 to <coughs> 40 glands that are around 5.5 millimeters in length and the lower lids are shorter with the lesser glands of 20 to 30 glands. So each gland has 10 to 15 secretory acne and MIBA is the lipid layer of the tears. So this is how the gland loss looks in mebography. So one more important thing if you don't have access to 
uh, mimography also this is the ascrs thing that is recommended llpp always look for the lash lid position blink position and tear meniscus lift the upper lid and look for the superior conjunctiva for slk upper lid laxity and flocksiness and push the lower lid and express the mg to see the mebum quality and quantity so llpc should be run routinely for all your cataract and any other refractive procedures as a primary procedure so now mebography is not something that you need a special equipment you can all you can do it also with your existing equipment or there is a simple diy i will share with you then there are dedicated equipments and also ivcm if you have an access to it so if you see this is white illumination and when there is surface ir illumination you can stand out the mebomian glands so these are different equipment that are available readily in your opd your auto ref nct iol master fundus camera and even specular microscope if you are able to just avert the lids you can beautifully see the mebomian glands the dy thing is the 850 nanometer light source that is available in amazon you can order it for around 7000 rupees and then once you have a camera in your uh, mobile phone that has no ir filter you can also identify the mebomian glands that can be looked like this next is uh, uh, dedicated mebographers that are uh, available so one of the uh, first things that were introduced was the lippy scan where you can see the mebography here it is also in my healthscape you have the serious and the anteres that have the mebography grading systems next there is the edra that is the latest thing that also gives you a 3d modeling of the mebomian gland and can show you the precise asni loss in each uh, gland so grading depending upon the area of loss it gives you an automated report of the degree from 0 to 1 1 being least and 4 being the highest so if you have an access to ivcm you can also look at the lumen of these mebomian glands so these are normal glands that have a good opening lumen obstruction with minimal infiltration this is moderate to severe and complete fibrosis and cell destruction of the epithelium so next coming to lipid layer thickness or non invasive tear bud time so this again you can see it with lippy view from johnson and johnson so if you have a lipid layer thickness of 100 and above it's considered to be normal anything below the lipid layer there is a deficiency this can also be uh, seen with the uh, mebomian gland dropouts and uh, you get a comprehensive report of both of these in the lippy view the next non invasive thing is the non invasive tear bud time it's more precise and more uh, uh, better than a uh, fluorescein strip that we see so once you ask the patient to blink here you can see those red spots occurring and here you have the exact seconds in which the dry spots occurs on the ocular surface so coming to the management uh, of um, mebomian gland disease we try to use uh, doxycycline for its anti mmp activity rather than its um, uh, antibiotic property and also add topical azithromycin and uh, orally for these cases and azithromycin and dexamethasone eye drops also can be used in these cases anti inflammatory role of cyclosporin is well established and rarely high uh, those steroids like dexamethasone or prednisolone are used usually these are used only in preoperative conditions where you want to rapidly stabilize the ocular surface uh, lifetigrast and interleukins are not available in india though the dream study tells there is no role of omega 3 fatty acids 80% of the acrs respondents have told that there is a role as an adjuvant therapy there is no harm in using it omega 3 fatty acid usually you use it for 3 to 6 months and blepharitis and desmodex you use tea tree oils and this simple thing all of us can do in our opds is the mebum expressions these mebum expressors are available from most of the surgical uh, microsurgical companies after warm compresses for a week's time with gentle expression you can remove the mebum from the glands in the opd in this way so next is the lippy flow this is the animation of the lippy flow so the advantage with lippy flow is it also acts in the inner part of the lid creating this compressions and heat and thus expressing out the struck mebum that is there inside the asni and the glands 
So that is the lippy flow in action where it creates that pulse style motions along with the heat. It's more like your warm compressors along with massage. Next is the Ilex. This is from Novartis. Again, this is not available in India, but this is a very simple thing that you can do in your OPD again. So it catch holds of the lid, increases the temperature, and then you can just press it out to express the Mebum from these conditions. So that is how it acts. And once you press it, the Mebum is expressed in that. So next in intense pulse light, uh, this is the thing that we are doing routinely. So far we have done in 76 cases. Usually we do it one month apart and two to three sittings would be required. Combining with, with Mebum expression and hot compressors yields better results. Usually you get a wow factor after the first sitting. There is definitely patient feels symptomatically better and better non-invasive T, but uh, we do it routinely, not routinely, but in cases where there is compromised cornea in refractive surgery and premium IOLs. So whenever you diagnose the uh, dry eye or compromised dry eye before surgery, it is the patient's problem. Post-operatively, it becomes the doctor's problem. This is the IPL animation. I'll skip it in interest of time. So these are the steps. Depending upon the skin color, the intensity of IRPL is adjusted. And we do it in five shots in each eye, four in the lower region and one in the lateral region. You can continue. Region. Uh... Yes, ma'am. And the last thing is the neurostimulation or nasal stimulation route. This is one more thing. New nasal stimulators have come that Re give rise to stimulation from the lacrimal gland because of the reflex stimulation and tearing happens. These are the nasal stimulators still yet to be available in India. So MDG therapies on a lighter note in a way are like your spouse. You pretend to control it but in reality the control is only transient. Thank you. Thank you, Madhu. You have uh, touched upon every uh, detail of uh, MGD. Nowadays, MGD is uh, overdiagnosed, I think. And uh, what we usually offer the patients were uh, like lid massage and bomb compressors and all. And mebography also is one of the mandatory tools uh, in uh, in the dry eye uh, work workup. Uh, because if there is a um, mebomian gland dropouts, there is no point in continuing your treatment, isn't it? So you can document and show your patient. This is the this is the your mebomian glands. Majority are dropout. So there is no point in continuing. That is a uh, advantage for, for doing this mebography. Okay. Can you on the lights, please? So we will take up a few questions regarding uh, regarding these two speakers, the previous talks. Any points to clear? So, Dr. Madhu, what are the mandatory tests you do for a dry eye patient? Are you having you are having your own setup? No, are you having a mebography and lippy view, lippy flow, and all? Is it mandatory to have it? Ma'am, if you see the juice to recommendation, first would be the symptoms. So we either take the DUQ5 questionnaire, which is a shorter questionnaire when compared to OSDI that has more questions. But once the patient complains of symptoms, it just does not have much of value. But after that, there are three sets of homeostasis tests in which you can do either one. So easily all of us can do without any equipment is the uh, lysamine green staining and uh, Shrimmers also, I would do it in the last month. Staining is the most important thing. If you have more than 10 conjunctival spots or uh, more than, uh, sorry, more than 10 conjunctival spots or more than 15 corneal dry spots or the lid margin is taking up the lesamine green stain, these are all indications that there is a definite problem with the ocular surface. Then you would go in with the non-invasive t butt that you can do either with the... Uh, uh, t butt I, that I showed you that's available in a lot of uh, equipment or you can do a invasive T butt and then if you have access to osmolarity they can do it but osmolarity is not needed but usually we depend more on the uh, staining and then followed by non-invasive T butt. These two tests we rely on and then we try to divide it into evaporative and uh, aqueous deficient. Mostly what we see is the 
evaporative dry eye. Sometimes there can be a combination. So tear meniscus site also you can measure it in the slit lamp with a good uh, graticule if you have a high magnification of the slit lamp. So all those points is very important, I think. So we all uh, think that uh, all sophisticated uh, tests are needed to diagnose your dry eye and treat your dry eye patients. But all these simple, simple techniques, you can categorize your patients, whether they are having MGD or any evaporative dry eye inflammation is going on uh, and so. And also we have our uh, young uh, corneal surgeon, Dr. Arjun from Comtrust. And Dr. Arjun, how will you do a Schirmer's test? Any, uh, because for the sake of the PGs over here, uh, what is the take home uh, they, you give for a Schirmer's? What is a dilute do you use? Uh, will you use paracaine or will you use a, a, a lubricant for the wetting of the, you know, you know, not Schirmer's, for the ocular surface staining? staining. Madam, uh, fluorescein staining wise. Yes, fluorescein. Yes, um, okay. Uh, yeah, if you follow the Japanese protocol, which they are going through, the staining pattern you have to be very clear. That usually take a st strip of fluorescein, put, if possible, normal saline or some other solution, not a lubricant, and put it on the strip. And then you nicely shake the strip so that the minimum amount of dye is left, and then you express the lid pull the lid away, slightly touch on the inferior lid margin so that the dye is just transferred onto the eye. And then you ask the patient to blink few times and then you go and assess how the tear is breaking up. Sometimes it's better as of now, few of my cases, I'm now using a yellow filter also. So that enhances the display. Now I'm seeing many things which I was not seeing earlier. A few patients were complaining, but the stain would look normal in the normal blue light, once I put the yellow filter, I start seeing more PEs than which I used to see, even the conjunctival ones. So that would be the simplest ways to do it. Exactly. So you have to create a hanging drop and then touch the, uh, no, do not touch the ocular surface and do not use any uh, li uh, things like paracaine and all. Um, and uh, uh, Anil can, I think, enlighten us more to the uh, selection of a lubricant that will be you have uh, you have touched upon trihalose based lubricants and also the osmo protectants so in uh, what uh, dry eye like uh, you select a, uh, osmo protectant or uh, is your trihalose your trihalose containing lubricant you are uh, and also the hyaluronidase are you using as a first line treatment I think it's a extremely difficult question to answer. <laughs> I think there are two components. One is the uh, the part that uh, as clinicians and as people who are researching on dry eye for so many years, people have not really found out exactly what is dry eye. That is the truth. Uh, I think during my post graduation, the only uh, lubricant that was available was Moisol. I think there is we have made a small progress, maybe five to ten percent progress. Nothing really beyond that. Uh, so, uh, there are a lot of talks on inflammation as a cause for dry eye. Yes, it is definitely there. About 65 to 70 percent benefit from it. And, and inflammatory therapy has its role. Uh, has, its, uh, has its role. But uh, generally speaking, uh, the, more, uh, the, the more common type of dry eye that we see is the short uh, tear breakup time. It can be either because of a lipid abnormality or because of a mucin abnormality. Mucin abnormality is something that is very commonly seen in especially computer visual display uh, terminal users. So that is the, uh, it's not really the inflammation sort of dry eye. In such people, uh, if you can use something which is mucomimetic, that would be much better. Just to, I mean, answer that question on which lubricant, how long, when to change, when to add some other, you know, agent to it. I think, uh, I, I think it is best to keep it simple. So first, you start with your CMC or your HPMC kind of agents. If they don't work, especially for the mild, eye, mild dry eye, if they don't work, for instance, the moderate ones, then you go in for polyethylene glycol, so the PEG component. I'm saying pharmacological names because uh, generally what happens is that the companies and all they tell you use this, use that and we really don't go into what is the pharmacological name. And if it still still doesn't work for moderate dry eye, then uh, you can use uh, sodium hyaluronate 
and then the third this is the third category and the fourth would be that you use a combination so when you use a combination you will use like sodium hyaluronate and cmc or you will use sodium hyaluronate and peg so that goes in for your moderate to severe dry eye very severe dry eye sometimes you may have to resort to you know tasoraphy or to punctal occlusion and your other kind of things of course where do these uh, immunosuppressants come in i think they come in whenever there is a component of inflammation then you have to give immunosuppressants which could be cyclosporin which could be liftigrast uh, and cyclosporin now has come in various concentrations and various formulations and i i always like to use topical steroids to break that vicious cycle in between because if it's really inflamed and dry and how do you know it's inflamed and dry it is red so you have to get it to the point where that red becomes white and when you have a white eye or an uninflamed eye then you know that there's no inflammation and you can continue with your lubricants as you do of course whenever your frequency increases more than four times a day then you go in for preservative free formulations because you don't want preservatives to be there because they again would have a have their toxicity effects that was exactly what we wanted ma'am thanks for that and uh, is it so we have the much awaited talk of our eminent speaker dr none other than dr namrata sharma from rp center so she'll be talking to us about a paradigm shift in the management of dry eye because so many drugs are coming up and uh, we all know that there is some ocular residence time ocular surface residence time because 70% of the of the, all the drops is lost due to blinking or uh, some other reason and all the companies are trying out to increase the residence time so different different techniques are into use like uh, so uh, thank increasing you. the strength of the dro drops and all thank over you, to you ma'am thank you anita and it's always always a pleasure to come to kerala and always i say this whenever i am on a platform in kerala and the best scene to see is you know so many female ophthalmologists almost 95% with due regards to all the men here but that's the pleasure to see which i don't see in any state so uh, lovely to be here again and uh, i'm so happy that all of uh, all of us are now taking ophthalmology at our times only 5% were ophthalmologists females and 95% were male of thermologists but it's lovely to see here so i would be talking to you about paradigm shift in management of inflammatory dry eye disease and it is a multifactorial disease i think you must have uh, this must have been already covered but it is a multifactorial disease because it's not a single symptom it's not a single sign it is something which was recognized from 2007 earlier it just was passed off as uh, dry eye then it is something which which actually encompasses the entire spectrum right from eyelids lashes tear film main and accessory lacrimal glands and the mammomian glands and there is loss of homeostasis which goes through the central pathophysiological concept again something which was not known symptoms are very important because they never corroborate with the signs that are there and there can be many etiologies which we really need to know and of course i think the most important thing is that you need to know when you are treating a patient of dry eyes whether the inflammatory component is there or not now this is a busy slide which just goes on to say that this is a vicious cycle of inflammation dry eye disease and mgd and when it is a vicious cycle you have to break it somewhere be it steroids it doesn't matter or be it immunosuppressants so when you break it at a particular point with the use of topical steroids or immunosuppressants then you can continue with lubricants lubricants are something which the patient you can never take them off once you start the patient on dry eye of course investigations i think madhu very nicely covered the investigations and uh, uh, there are various signs which need to be treated like conjunctival hyperemia conjunctival staining because with the lysamine green uh, which will tell you the extent of inflammation then the lit parallel conjunctival folds confocal microscopy may not be available everywhere tear osmolarity i think is important but i think it is more an effect rather than the cause of the dry eye and i also feel i don't i haven't i mean i did go through the first half but i feel that it is slightly overrated but then of course if it becomes normal then it helps you to know 
uh, that you know your treatment is working. MMP9, which again is uh, not very specific because it has to go really high to be detected and to be saying that there's some inflammation which is present. So there are triaging questions, the risk factor analysis, the diagnostic tests and the subtype classification because based on the classification you are going to treat. So if it is a mild dry, it is only patient education, modification of the local environment and ocular lubricants. I, like I told you, and I, initially I would start ocular lubricants four times a day, which would be something like a CMC. Then step two, if it is more than four times a day, we start with non-preservative lubricants. Demodex with, uh, will be treated with tea tree oil. Tear conservation is very important with punctal occlusion if required. And of course the drugs have to be uh, prescribed. And if there is inflammation, then topical steroids can be given four times a day in frequency. I don't like to give, uh, although this is a sun pharma session, but I don't like to give lotopred or FML for that matter. If I have to give steroids, I'll give a full-on steroids because we want to break that vicious cycle. So it will be something like prednisolone prednis prednis acetate, which will be four times a day. Then topical non-steroidal anti-immunomodulators, uh, uh, cyclosporin has a role to play. Liftigrast is undergoing trials, is available as Zydra in US, but is still not available with us, and or oral macrolide or tetracycline wherever indicated. Now, if it is very severe and the patient is really uncomfortable, you can give oral secretogogues, which could be pilocarpine, which is given three times a day, but again, the systemic side effects are quite a bit. Then autologous or allogenic serum eye drops can be given, and these are helpful, 20% uh, in concentration. And of course, if the above options are inadequate, then you have to give topical steroids for longer duration, amniotic membrane transplants, tarsorafi, and even minor salivary gland transplantation. Now, what are the challenges? The, we have a definite ground why immunomodulators should be started, but there are certain challenges which are there, and these include the following. Now, there have been studies in more than 7,000 patients which had patients of topical cyclosporin also, and majority of the patients actually discontinued uh, topical cyclosporin, close to 60%, uh, close to 70%, and close to 60% discontinued liftigrast. So discontinuation does occur in these patients, and this occurs mostly because of burning and stinging, and lag time which is there between the treatment initiation and experiencing the symptomatic relief. So this may lead to disease progression, especially when the patient discontinues. And so you do require a maintenance therapy. Now currently we have liftigrast, but the liftigrast also causes other side effects like dysgeusia and reduced visual acuity or blurring in some of the cases, apart from uh, eye discharge, eye discomfort, hyperemia, sinusitis, etc. Uh, topical cyclosporin, 0.05%, which is currently available, does cause ocular burning in almost 17% of the cases, apart from conjunctival hyperemia, discharge, uh, pain, foreign body sensation, stinging, etc. And the effect of the topical cyclosporin, 0.05%, which is currently available, starts within six weeks. So the unmet need is that the currently available cyclo, cyclosporin is actually uh, available to you in oil and aqueous solution. And uh, the solution with the drug particles do get suspended in oil particles, but it tends to be unstable with poor ocular tolerab tolerability, hampers the dissolution and penetration into aqueous tissue, and it must be sh shaken to resuspend the drug particles Again, it will cause blurred vision and low bioavailability in ocular uh, tissues, which will impact on the onset of action, which I said was six weeks. Mm -hmm. Now, cyclosporin 0.09% is the ophthalmic solution, which is made by the nano uh, micellar uh, cell technology, which basically has a hydrophobic shell. So this allows transport through the tear film onto the ocular surface and has a hydrophobic core. Uh, which prevents the encapsulated cyclosporin from being released until after the penetration into the aqueous layer. So because of this, the penetration is also faster and it acts uh, faster. Now, uh, again, this is to show the same, that this uh, N-cell encapsulates uh, and this, uh, this hydrophilic uh, shell which is there, it gets dissolved. 
So the, with the end cell technology, the cyclosporin penetrates inside and then it gets delivered onto the uh, uh, ocular surface as well as intraocularly. Now this was a study which was done in animal uh, eyes, the New Zealand rabbit eyes and just to show that if you look at the concentration of 0.05% uh, restasis versus 0.05% uh, micellar cyclosporin and uh, versus 0.1% micellar cyclosporin, then you can see that the 0.1% micellar cyclosporin in conjunctiva and cornea has higher concentration and again in all the tissues in fact has higher concentration. So it has gone through three phases, phase 2B, three uh, clinical trials, phase 3 clinical trials and the long term safety extension uh, study and if we uh, look at it, this was the phase 2B, phase 3 study which looked at nanomicellar cyclosporin which came by the term of OTX101. 0.09 percent, uh, vis-a-vis vehicle, vis-a-vis 0.05 percent because they wanted to look at which concentration is better, 0.05 percent or 0.09 percent and the treatment duration was uh, 12 weeks. And it was found that the one which had nanomicellar cyclosporin 0.09 percent had uh, faster action which was uh, two weeks as opposed uh, to the vehicle. So uh, that is why it is more efficacious as compared to 0.05% na nanomicellar as well as 0.05% uh, which is commercially available. Now this was another study which was again randomized control trial, trial in more than 700 patients which looked at the one which was proven that means nanomicellar 0.09% vis-a-vis vehicle to look at the safety and this was again done for 12 weeks and at all points in time it was found that the nanomicellar cyclosporin uh, had uh, improved the total corneal staining much more as compared to the vehicle and I think corneal staining is very important because corneal staining means that the patient is having symptoms and is also having signs. Then uh, this was again uh, for the global symptom score uh, or what we called as SANDE, that is how we, uh, uh, we analyze the symptoms of the patient and again both the treatment groups they demonstrated 30% mean decrease from baseline in, modif in modified SANDE scores and there was no different difference in the treatment effect which was observed uh, and of course artificial tears were not allowed in this study. Now again in visual acuity again the same data it was found that the nanomicellar cyclosporin patients did better and uh, there was also at 3 months 65% of the central corneas were completely clear with 56.9% uh, in cases of nanomicellar versus 38.3% uh, uh, otherwise and the same results were also replicated at 3 months uh, follow up. Now this is the real world treatment in patients with dry eye disease. How did they arrive at it? They looked at, they went to all the insurance companies. In India, this treatment is not uh, covered by insurance or these drugs may not be covered. But this was a study which was in US where drugs are covered by insurance. And they wanted to know how many patients were on cyclosporin 0 0.9, 0 0.05 or lifting rest. How, what was the discontinuation time to treatment and discontinuation of these and it was again found that the patients who were in the group of nanomicellar cyclosporin, uh, the mean treatment duration was 11.6 months, vis a vis 8 months for liftigrast, vis a vis uh, almost 7.9 months for the uh, commercially available cyclosporin. So the uh, discontinuation rate with the nanomicellar cyclosporin is also less. Now uh, this again looked at uh, the installation site pain uh, to stop the dry eye disease. And more than 95% of the patients experienced either no or mild installation of the site pain with the uh, nanomicellar cyclosporin, which is actually being marketed as CEQA from the Sun Pharma pharmaceuticals. This was for the safety, whether there were any ocular adverse events or not. And again, the issues were only two. That was pain at the site of installation and conjunctival uh, hyperemia. Blurred vision was present in less than 1% of the cases. And uh, of course, uh, uh, cyclosporin A, 0.09% of the CEQA 
did not report any taste alterations which is there with the liftigrast. So, uh, what were the conclusions of the studies which were done with cyclosporin 0.09 percent? The conclusions were that from day one, no or mild installation of site pain for more than 95 percent of patients. After just 14 days, it starts to act in the sense that it improves corneal staining. So, its uh, duration of action is only two weeks. Uh, at month one, patients had a reduction in total corneal staining and also symptoms which improved. Uh, visual acuity also improved. Uh, almost two thirds of the patient were completely had clear corneas and tear production, which nearly doubled. And at one year, more patients were still using this drug as compared to liftigrast and the commercially available cyclosporin 0.05%. And of course, the most common adverse events reported were pain and conjunctival hyperemia in these patients. So thank you very much for your kind attention. And if there are any questions, we can uh, Thank take you, ma'am, for this enlightening talk. Uh, so this is your chance to catch hold of Dr. Amrita, ma'am. Uh, so she, she has vast experience uh, in uh, treating ocular surface disease and she is an authority in any cornea topic or ocular surface for that matter. So uh, this is a time for audience interaction. Um, any of your doubts can be cleared. So I have Dr. a doubt, Pichu. I think let's clear that also. Where is Sun Parma? So, what about the economics of CEQA vis-a-vis -vis, uh, re Because I think uh, people don't want to use re because it is very expensive. I hope your drug is uh, cheaper than re Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the cost of actually uh, cyclosporin being marketed by Allergan that is costing 25.55 for a box of 30 unims. Vis-a-vis Sequa, -vis which has 30 unims, is uh, costing 1722 rupees to your patients. So this is a 0.25 ml vial, which has got enough drops. Even if the patient is wasting it to use the unim, still it has got enough number of drops to take care of the dosage part. Almost 850 rupees economical uh, per box of 30 unims as compared to Allergan's product. Okay, I have another question for you. You have a cycloimmune, which is 0.1%. Uh, so what do we do? Shall we tell all the patients stop this and start using Sequa? So ma'am, uh, uh, I have been only involved with uh, promoting this product for last 16 years in my division only. So this is one such product which will definitely, uh, I would say, meets uh, unmet needs as you were mentioning about it. I'm not saying anything is bad, but only thing is that something better comes up in the market. As Madam was pointing out, the product cyclosporin, which is currently available in emulsion form, it is hydrophobic in nature and it takes good three months to reach the required concentration in tissues of cornea conjunctiva. That is how the delayed response of current cyclosporin is there. Now, since it is encapsulated with the uh, hydrophilic outer layer, the penetration is far more superior and within 14 days you will see. Uh, I was reading through one of the uh, promotional article given by Allergan that the concentration of drug reaching cornea tissues, it is uh, 1440 nanogram per gram in cornea with their product, which against with Sequa it is 4800 nanogram per gram. So you can imagine the concentration of the drug reaching cornea tissues so quickly and giving faster relief to your patients. Costs sometimes become imperative, but at the end of the day, what happens is the longevity of treatment with the conventional cyclosporin and the one which is available, mm -hmm. since it gives a quick response, I think your patient's religiousness to continue with the medication and see the results quickly will be one of the best thing to happen for your patients. Okay. Choice is all yours. It is Thank a platter you. which is Thank available. You. But then I believe that the current, whatever new things are happening, it is for the betterment of patient. And hopefully, I think patients are going to benefit a lot. It's been mm -hmm. almost six months of promotion. But then we have received a tremendous response. Even Madam Namrata also, I think she will vouch for it. She had been using since the launch of this product. And uh, Dr. Anil sir also, I think I came almost three months back and met him. He had been also using No, it. no, we are still trying it, uh, Deepak. We have not no, no, watching I it, but because we have a whole gamut of drugs, our, uh, our uh, this thing and I can discuss it with the other panelists also, our dilemmas are uh, quite a lot. One, that the patients uh, who are already on re 
and are doing well will not change to will not change to sequa because you know they are used to raised taxes and they can afford it one I, is this second is that uh, again we know about raised taxes and we know about cyclosporin 0.05% that you can continue it for say uh, at least one year and if you want to stop again these are the things which we have to look even for the nano micellar one how long can you continue it when should you stop you know uh, for 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 what prolonged how long do you dr anil how do you how long do you continue your cyclosporin for i mean we give it for say one year and then when do you when do you think you now need to stop it yeah uh, it's difficult to say ma'am like the restasis when they launched they told that you can use it for 6 months to 1 year and try stopping it but a lot of patients actually had recurrence of the symptoms once you stopped it so a lot of them are on long term therapy for a long i mean for long periods same for you i think anita do you ma'am i have not started using uh, sequa because the pharmacy where i was work, uh, where i am working now no, but is not the cyclosporin in general cyclosporin actually uh, it is a it is not a wonder drug and uh, it has it uh, takes its own time to act so one year is the minimum time i wait i give and if the patient Madhu, is about what what about you Ma minimum is one year maximum Usually, till the time the patient. I don't on. usually continue it on a long term. I use it for three months, ma'am. Give a break. Uh, use low dose steroids in between, and again start it. Okay. I don't. So that is also a good model to you know give breaks to break that vicious cycle yes, which sir. we were talking about, and then to uh, yes. start restart, restart again. Restart it. Yeah. I have patients who are almost on. Five years of cyclosporin, but the problem is the moment you withdraw, like Dr. Anil was saying, they are not happy with it and they want to, you know, come back to it again. So I think with your product, these are the type of questions we will need to answer, which we have not answered with the existing products. And if that, you know, is taken care of, then possibly, of course, one big advantage is that it starts to act in less than two weeks, which is good. because then you don't have to put the patients on topical steroids for a prolonged period of time which is 6 weeks yeah, so you are sh shortening the uh, topical steroid period by about 4 weeks the other indication where we started using it is in the post refractive sci myops who are usually steroid responders we are tapering them to lotiprednol low strength along with this and then slowly we are stopping lotiprednol also and continuing on cyclospf especially post prk okay, okay yeah post prk post prk high powers i may have usually become steroid anybody has any question yes good afternoon ma'am ma'am you have five layers of cornea we already know that is something called duse layer sixth layer what is its composition what is its main function sixth layer of cornea where is there any post graduate here <laughs> that comes as a short note the sixth of the layer of the cornea is duas layer which Duce is layer, duas, duas layer, layer duas. which is present just above the desmids membrane and uh, it's about uh, 10 microns in thickness and it's actually i think it's nothing but the condensation of collagen which is present right above the desmids membrane so it is having collagen not cells it's having no, no 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 it is having collagen anybody any anyone can frame a better answer than what i have framed i'm sure <laughs> madhu can madhu <laughs> any other question that anybody would want to ask now can i make a comment ma'am like yes, see uh, this regarding uh, other aqueous based cyclosporin preparations i don't know i have my reservations about it i have used multiple products and i have not seen the same response with the Uh, emulsion. the emulsion form uh, either restasis or uh, the sequa product so it is i think other one is much inferior definitely which one is inferior Aqu the aqueous aqueous based aqueous one. based Compared is much inferior compares like we have a lot of uh, products which are available which are aqueous based which makes sense also because it is basically cyclosporin is uh, lipid soluble it does not penetrate the yeah. uh, cornea just like that I think you need to study comparing the two of them. Only thing is, the sample size is going to be really huge, huge. because you are comparing the same kind of product. And to to be able to show a difference, you need in both the arms very huge number of uh, cases. Like I said, we would need to study this. Of course, it's a good drug with a 
huge promise yes ma'am uh, you, you will be planning an in house study i think no in rp center so we have yesterday Probably. only submitted one on i'll say in front of him it doesn't matter restasis versus sequa in uh, <laughs> right a randomized controlled study <laughs> so any other indications you are planning like higher risk graphs or pediatric graphs or uh, no as of now only in dry eye but i'm sure uh, there could be other indications just to complete the picture topical cyclosporin it can be used for so many things to prevent graft rejection to treat graft rejection especially in steroid responders ligneous conjunctivitis dry eye vernal keratoconjunctivitis SPK, no, no. SPK. Numular keratitis. Numular keratitis. Numular adenoviral keratoconjunctivitis. I think it has a huge role to play, especially when you keep getting those numular opacities again and again and again. So in that also, uh, if you use uh, topical steroids and topical uh, uh, cyclosporin and then continue it, say, for some time and then stop the steroids and then continue the patient on topical cyclosporin, then the chances of recurrence are much less. Thank you, ma'am. I think the session will end in thank five you. minutes. And uh, I thank all the all the delegates who have... Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> we are very happy to see a packed hall. And uh, uh, the dry eye armamentarium is increasing day by day. And don't get carried away with all the uh, uh, this uh, uh, products available. Like any other disease, dry eye also should be uh, gone in a stepwise manner and uh, don't uh, um, leave anything and uh, uh, find out uh, which patient requires which drug and uh, you are, you are, th that will be quite rewarding. Any Thank other you. points, any comments or anything? So I thank all my panelists. A big thank you for Namrata ma'am who thank has a so flight much. to catch and also <laughs> thank you we so pulled much. her enough. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Atat.